The knights looked up and were frightened, for they were obviously very worried about what was to come next. Iriella was also going through a bad time, for they were going to have some very difficult times ahead of them. While she was thinking, someone came into her room to tell her that the Pope had ordered for the saint to be sent to the border, and the order had been issued by the Pope himself. To think we'd be faced with such a force that the Pope would even order the saint to join the battle. She was also told that they had already asked for them, and however it seems that they will take at least four or five days for them to arrive. But she can't believe in that, because if that's the case, who is traveling alongside the saint? The boy informed her that the 3D Paladin Order and the Holy Altar, along with the Royal Guardsmen, and they are currently en route to the border. Iriel was just extremely surprised by this, since no one had told her about it. So are these all the troops they have? The guy only remained silent, so the girl started to shout and get angry, once again asking, Has the Pope gone mad? Their opponent is a necromancer from the Age of Sorcery, and she is sure he's well aware that is not enough to fend them off. Meanwhile, in the Age of Sorcery in the far past, magic was the topic of research and the entire continent was blooming with innovations in magic. However, Forces that used dark magic brought an end to that age and the one that was considered to be the key cause of their downfall. The king of the dead is Necromancer. So he managed to be revived. Meanwhile, the servant continued to tell the horrifying news that they have to deal not only with external conflicts, but also with the coming rebellion. For they can see the mood of the people and therefore are unable to send a larger army. Iriel summarizes with quiet gloom that the border is not that important to the Pope right now, and inside her, rage and resentment burns brightly for the saint the Pope is using as an expendable commodity to maintain his power. All of a sudden, the door swings open with a wild shriek from a temple servant, and it turns out that while Iriel was reported one piece of information, another has already appeared and now the enemy army is approaching much faster than expected. Iriel shrank with anger and despair. Suddenly, she abruptly leaves her place, and under the surprised shouts of two servants, runs out of the room, unable to waste any more time on all this uselessly. In the meantime, a bugle trumpets in defense of the Empire, calling the soldiers to full battle readiness and one of the army commanders announces the approach of the enemy army and demands to raise their weapons. On command, arrows immediately flew into the air, cutting through the blue sky with a deadly cloud, and the enemy army, including skeletons, immediately felt the weapons of humans. The confrontation between the living and the undead heated up. Neither wanted to retreat. The holy woman called on God for help asking him to support the soldiers so that their bodies would become stronger and be able to withstand this battle. With glittering hands holding the book, she spread God's grace to the soldiers around her, boldly looking into the eyes of the enemies. The soldiers immediately felt their bodies fill with divine power and rushed into battle with renewed vigor, hoping to finish everything before the reinforcement forces arrived. The commander of the squad immediately shouted at the soldiers not to relax because of this help, because the enemies are acting in a variety of insidious methods, and most importantly, the strongest is still ahead. And his words were confirmed, when the first appeared white spirits with terrible smiles, banshees, and black, impenetrable laths, dead knights. The commander shouted in horror to the soldiers to retreat and regroup before it was too late for them. But it was too late for him. One of the banshees was right in front of his face, extending its sharp claws towards him. Both the temple servants and the soldiers began to flee, unable to bear what was happening, but none of them could escape. And in the midst of these cries of pain and suffering, in a dark cloak hiding him from head to toe, stood the necromancer, savoring every drop of spilled blood. He ordered his dead not to let go of a single living soul, and immediately the soldiers felt how the enemy army became stronger. 
And as much as the surviving commander tried to help the soldiers by recalling them, he had a terrible thought were they really alone with the dead? The commander did not have time to dodge the mace of the huge dead man and prepared to say goodbye to his life. But in a split second, the situation changed, and a white glow saved him from horrible destruction. Ray appeared on the battlefield in his developing white robes, with such martial energy on his face, that even the commander exhaled with delight and relief. Remembering how he rushed to the army defending the Empire, Ray also recalled how the Pope had ordered him to go to the border because of the difficult situation in the Empire. So now that all the soldiers were surprised to see the saint, Ray only activated his powers while gloomily looking ahead. Turning around, he ordered those who remained in formation to divide the wounded among the priests to heal them as soon as possible. But the soldiers and temple servants were unsure, for if they helped the wounded, fewer people would be able to defend against the undead's attack. Until they saw that the bones of the dead around Ray had already managed to melt like ice cream in the heat, and they praised the saint's strength with admiration. Ray only hummed as he faced the army of dead running at him, led by the necromancer. Although his saint's powers helped a lot, due to the fact that skeletons and other foul things were numerous, he decided to use his magic as well, sending a fireball forward. Explosions and bright flames filled the battlefield, burning everything in its path. And once the fire had calmed down and the smoke had cleared, only one figure with raised arms stood proudly alone, covered by a translucent purple shield. Without fear, Ray assumed it must be the necromancer. The old man in the cloak stared at the guy in shock, not understanding how he was able to use magic being a saint. The necromancer, with the anger inherent in working with the dead, began to cast another black curse, unwilling to give up so easily. With his command to cast off the calls of the underworld and bring death to its knees, he summoned another endless army of the undead and sent it into battle. The knights of the army once again stirred behind Ray, looking at the new number of those they would have to fight, losing their lives. But the saint was with them for a reason. With one spell and the power of the saint, he managed to get rid all the summoned dead, causing the necromancer to retreat a step in horror. The old man in the cloak shouted that he would never give up and that no one would stop him sending another deadly spell specifically at Ray. Once again, he was defeated with a gesture of one hand. The holy chains bound the necromancer before he could cast any more terrible spells. Ray's incredible strength, his skills and the combination of divine power and magic led the necromancer to a surprising thought he couldn't just be a saint. He must have already approached the level of a god. The Weeping Knight, no longer afraid to approach the necromancer, knocked the thought out of his head with his fist. Looking sadly at the blazing field, Ray realized the reason for his tears. Those people who had fallen in this battle were also becoming dead, and unfortunately falling under the power of the necromancer. And all those they saw now in this horrible state used to be someone's slain family. Ray berated himself for not coming sooner so he did the only thing he could in this situation summoning the Scylla of the Saint. He laid the dead to rest, giving them a relieving oblivion. A cleansing rain covered the battlefield, covering the soldiers and priests mourning for their lost loved ones. Ray, chiding himself for his slowness, looked sternly at the kneeling necromancer, not forgetting the real culprit. But when he asked if he felt guilty for what he had done, and if he was afraid of joining the dead he had ruled before, the necromancer laughed madly. Paying no further attention to the insane old man, Ray ordered him to be taken to the Holy Empire. Having done his business at this place, he hurried to help at the next point, for the war didn't end here. Meanwhile, the dead were terrorizing another city where the saint was already waiting. And in that place, using her holy power, the locals were protected by Iriel, supporting the soldiers. 
Divine power shone in her eyes as she looked at the next approaching wave of the dead. Alas, besides the undead, there was also an unknown army among them, so it was doubly difficult for them. A sudden sword thrust caused an explosion that scattered a crowd of skeletons around her. Iriel stared at it in surprise, trying to figure out what it was, until, in answer to her unspoken question, the pink-haired and purple-haired knights appeared before her, apologizing to the saint for being late and saying that there was nothing to worry about now that they were here. Iriel, on the other hand, was even more worried, for Lord Zeke was supposed to be with Ray, and now he was without his support. When she heard that Lord Zeke had been ordered here by Ray himself, she couldn't believe her ears. The knight recalled the past, in which Ray had ordered him to stay in Salonia, because if he went after the saint, he would only cause him inconvenience instead of support. And when Lord Zeke had resented it, and still asked to go with him, worried about Ray, he had offered to fight Ray one-on-one -on -one to prove that he would not be in the way. The man apologized for pulling his sword from its sheath and swung at Ray, not doubting his strength. Well, he should have doubted because the huge sword was able to hold back a tiny aura sword no bigger than a dagger. And now, Zeke's sense of self-importance was hurt, because he couldn't imagine Ray's strength if he was able to deflect a blow with a small dagger. After explaining all of this to Iriel, he justified his coming to her aid, making her stand in wonder. Iriel, however, forgetting her image as a saint, looked anxiously at the sky worrying about Ray, and even daring to call him an idiot, not understanding the real danger, in front of the other knight. Ray, thankfully, could not hear such disbelief in his powers. At that moment running into another city full of already broken dead. There he was met by the crying child he had saved earlier, holding her little sister in her arms. Ray snapped out of his shoes, immediately running up to them and checking on the unconscious little girl's condition. However, contrary to his hopes, he was unable to trace any pulse, breathing, or consciousness in poor Chris's body. The child cuddled closer to her sister, unable to let her go while Ray regretted that she was too weak even before what had happened. With tears in his eyes, the child admitted that he had to protect his sister no matter what not reacting when Ray instead blamed himself. After all, he shouldn't have brought them here, and apologizing for the pain he had caused her with that decision. Mary disagreed, continuing to sob and blaming only herself and her weakness. And as Ray towered over the broken child, his eyes came across a knight behind the children. Clearly not gone from the Holy Empire soldiers, it must have been Mary defending herself and protecting her sister. Ray, looking collected and serious, ordered everyone who was hiding to come out into the light. Though not the first time, but only when he named who was standing where, the mysterious pursuers showed themselves, and their distinguishing feature was a bone mask on the lower half of their faces. Bending in greeting, all the members of the Dane family, the seven messengers, manifested in the darkness of the night. One of the seven messengers introduced herself first, respectfully placing her hand on her chest. She also introduced the other six messengers in turn, and each of them had a unique appearance and identical bone masks on their faces that concealed their identities from prying eyes. They were given names that differed only in the first name, but the second name was still Yang, which made Ray puzzled for a second. With his hands on his chest, he explained that he had summoned them all because he wanted them to take care of Mary. Hong Yong, the first of the seven messengers, squinted slightly to make sure that she had heard him correctly and that he was referring to the living child behind him. After hearing Ray's words about Mary's special abilities and constitution of body and spirit, the messenger confirmed that she was indeed able to survive, where everyone else was already lying down. Hong Yong objected to raising her as an assassin. Before he could clarify exactly what he wanted, Ray heard another messenger ask if he wanted them to train the child in special techniques, and Ray happily complimented her on her guesswork. Hong Yong again declined, 
as they had a primary assignment, and that was to protect Ray, and they couldn't waste time on anything else. Besides, they needed to protect the identities of each of the seven messengers, and taking care of the child implied a high risk that they would be exposed in the future. All in all, the messengers refused until the last, when a desperate Ray mentioned that he could make it in order. Seeing all seven people flinch at that word, the saint's eyes lit up, and he seized the opportunity by simply issuing a full-fledged order. The messengers, reluctantly, but had to obey the order. Ray also ordered them to take care of the little girl's funeral, and Mary herself to listen carefully and train with the messengers, as they were trustworthy people. Having dealt with the problem here, Ray sternly turned around and headed off to where his help was still needed. Meanwhile, things were not going smoothly for Iriel, though the soldiers did not notice this, continuing to receive the saint's blessing. Dressed in knightly armor, the woman commanded the knights and motivated them not to give up and get the victory. As soon as the loud words were spoken, she exhaled heavily, covered in sweat, and the girl knight worried whether she was fine after using so much holy power. To distract her, Iriel asked to take control of the left flank and monitor their progress, which the girl immediately fell for. When she left, Iriel had a moment to realize that she couldn't go on like this. There was no end to the battle, and no matter how strong she was, she wouldn't be able to bless the knights indefinitely. As she thought about it, the woman barely dodged the unexpected blow, miraculously jumping aside. Cradling her injured arm, she stared in disbelief at Duke Sahard who had attacked her. Lord Zeke stepped up to her defense and covered her, clarifying if the saint was all right. Lord Zahard slung his one-handed weapon over his shoulder and greeted both Iriel and Zeke sarcastically, not at all looking upset or offended by the guy's words about his betrayal of God. He mustered up the courage to argue with a mad grin that the Holy Empire had no future because of its small size, unable to withstand the power of the superhumans. Iriel was annoyed at his behavior to the point of gritting her teeth, but there was nothing she could do to counter the master of the sword. She wasn't sure if she could fight him at full strength, and even Lord Zeke's presence wouldn't help. Suddenly, Lord Zahard suggested that each side retreat, and the saint wondered what his plan might be, for despite her recent doubts, the holy power was very motivating to the soldiers, and yet they would not be able to defeat the master of the sword. Gritting her teeth, Iriel agreed in her mind that it was not a bad suggestion to pause and wait for reinforcements. When she voiced her thoughts aloud, Lord Zahard grinned contentedly and called it a wise decision. But as he was about to leave, satisfied that he had achieved his goal, he was stopped by someone's voice, and Iriel flinched, unable to control herself. Surrounded by holy magic, Ray was approaching them from behind, sternly wondering who this lord thought he was, daring to make a mess of things and flee the scene without being punished. Ray looked almost insane, ready to defend what he held dear to him to the last, summoning all his power, both divine and various kinds of magic, against the flaming orb. Considering that the human body can only withstand divine power, or only magic because in saints, magic transforms into divine power. Lord Zahard couldn't take his eyes off the picture in front of him right now. Ray, placing his hands on his hips in a relaxed pose, asked him if he had any last words before total defeat. Looking for ways out of the situation, something occurred to the Lord, and he suggested to Ray a battle between the protégés of each side. Zeke hastens to ask Ray not to get hot and accept the offer from the traitor, as he might be up to something, but when has the saint ever turned down a good battle? He cancelled the fireball spell, and Zahard thought with joyous excitement that Ray was just a round fool who thought he was a fool. Ray, in his usual manner, beckoned his opponent toward him without moving or drawing his weapon. Still thinking it was foolish, the swordmaster calculated the saint's weak points, 
sensing that he finally had a chance to deal with the threat. After all, even if Ray is an Archimage capable of summoning a meteor, it makes no sense for him as long as he can't use magic. Boots creaked under Zahard's sudden jerk as he pushed himself off the ground in seconds and took a wide swing, leaping out of the air at Ray. Still as unflustered, Ray summoned the Aura Sword in his hand, glowing with blue divine power. This was something the Lord was unprepared for, and as he met Ray's sword with all his might, he felt a recoil of terrifying power. He was thrown back a couple of meters, almost dragged across the battlefield, and a small but noticeable crack formed on the powerful two-handed sword. A relaxed Ray stood before Zahard, almost provoking the man to the same thoughts the necromancer had earlier. Who the hell was the guy who could summon meteorites, use divine energy, and create aura swords? Where did he even come from? Sahard made another attempt, thrusting his sword at the saint, gritting his teeth with eagerness. He tried his best until he found Ray acting strangely, and the guy with the crazy grin was finally able to play to his full potential, having learned from Zahard all the time before in practice, and adopting his fighting style. So now he was already attacking Zahard, not giving him a moment's respite, for even his thoughts were now racing. He had made a huge mistake. The saint, in a devious move, deceived the Lord and when he put his sword up to protect his neck, slashed him in the leg, declaring that he would not give men like the Lord a second chance. Zahard, feeling the wound, feeling Ray's speed and strength, and realizing that his fighting style was not only being copied, but improved upon as he went along, begged for mercy, taking a knee. The guy pointed his aura sword at Zahard and began to interrogate him, saying that a swordsman like him would be too ashamed to follow someone else's orders. So surely, he was acting on his own accord. The man who had bowed his head suddenly rose out of the blue and tried to attack from the sneak shouting that he only wanted to show the nobles in the shadows that even harsh methods like his could change the world. Of course, Ray deflected the blow, and afterward made his sword disappear for a second. To Zahard's surprise, a second later, that moment remained the last he had ever seen in his life as his head rested on the ground separate from his body. At about the same time, in a quieter place, the commanders of knights and mages of the various kingdoms listened to the news of what had happened earlier on the battlefield, coming to shock. The sight of a defeated, bound, and powerless necromancer who had managed to be captured alive caused large question marks in their minds. A soldier from the Holy Empire's army smiled and thanked the people from other kingdoms who had come to help but said with a relieved expression that the necromancer had already been taken care of. The servant who ran up to him drew the attention of everyone present, for he brought good news the rebel forces had been all but defeated. Iriel was rubbing her tired wrists in the company of the unchanged Zeke and Fea, but as she looked around, she was pleased that they had cleared most of the area. The pink-haired Fea put a finger to her lips wondering about Ray's origins since he had come here so easily and solved almost all of their problems on the battlefield. When Zeke tiredly asked her to watch her tongue, when she spoke of the saint, everything was coming to an end when a purple glow appeared on the horizon and a terrifying force pressed them to the ground as if coming out of nowhere. Fea, Zeke, and Iriel were once again forced to prepare for battle blown by the icy strong wind. The glow intensifying with each passing second made Iriel's eyes widen in horror. In front of them, the bone dragon loomed, embraced in hellish purple flames. A rumble of thunder signaled the arrival of a new demonic force, and Ray, who had sensed it when he arrived at the manor, realized with a sigh that it was time to head back to the battlefield. The maid he had asked to take care of a few things for him agreed and relayed that she would be sure to pay special attention to the girl he had rescued. Hearing that the child was to be taken care of by the seven messengers, the maid squinted at the Dane family and was not happy about it. 
Things were not going so well for Iriel and company, for the bone dragon had brought with it new problems, and now its huge wings and powerful strength were simply blowing the poor soldiers off their feet. The saintess folded her arms and summoned her divine power, and once again glowed with a warm golden light to help the army and resist the death spawn. But contrary to her hard work, although some skeletons burned in the divine glow, there were still too many crawling and reaching for them from all sides. Fea wanted to lead Saint away, but she didn't have time looking straight into the jaws of the monster towering above her. Saint froze in a strange frenzy. The bone dragon reflected in her eyes, and only then she realized its hidden essence. It was not just a huge flying skeleton, but a real monster, the dragon of fear. Her whole body stiffened, not allowing her head to move either. Iriel felt her consciousness floating away, and fear made her heart beat so often that it was about to fly out of her chest, piercing her ribcage. Suddenly, Saint felt a small sense of relief, but it was only a matter of time before her sight returned, and she saw Fea and Zeke covering her back and taking the full force of the blow. Neither of them could move, but the snapping sound was coming closer to the girl knight, and she froze now not just in induced terror, but actual fear, for she could not move, and behind her the skeleton was already reaching for her. As she braced herself for the worst, a sword blew off half of the skeleton's body. It was the work of Lord Zeke, who managed to overcome the monstrous force and began to move, returning to the battle. He didn't feel half his strength and doubted he would last long, but he needed to protect his partner and the saint, so he had no choice but to raise his sword and grip it tighter. Zeke fought like a wolf, out of his last strength, not falling to the skeletons or under the eye terrifying demons. There were too many of them, however, and at a certain point a snapping sound meant a cloud of bones coming at him. They buried him beneath them, pressing down from above and blocking even the slightest sliver of visibility. Fea asked the saint in a panic what they could do, for she couldn't move. But if they did nothing, Zeke wouldn't last that long. No matter how hard Iriel tried, the divine energy wouldn't leave her body, frozen with her. There was an explosion, and the skeletons scattered in different directions under Zeke's power but he himself was in very bad shape, covered in wounds and scratches, breathing heavily. A weeping Fea asked him if he was all right, but since she couldn't move to see for herself, Zeke risked deceiving her by claiming she was overreacting. He himself feeling tired for the first time as a swordmaster, still unable to steady himself, but walked over to the dragon, leaning on his sword. Unable to stand still, Seeing that the dragon only inspires fear, but does not approach on its own, the Lord makes a serious decision it is necessary to attack this monster, not for nothing he has trained so long. He fights back as best he can, but even though he has been called a genius in swordsmanship since he received the title of Master Swordsman at a very young age, he was unable to deal with the army of the undead on his own. Having been seriously injured, one of his last thoughts was regretting that it was him, and not someone stronger who could handle this dragon, and not put the saint in danger. That was when Ray's calm voice caught up with him, surrounding him with divine power, and reassuring that Zeke had held out well until his arrival. Holding out his hand and muttering a cleansing spell, Ray destroyed the skeletons reaching for the kneeling lord. Now they were one on one the holy genius ray against the bone dragon of fear, almost the battle of the century. Standing in front of the dragon, Ray remembered reading articles on dark magic, which spoke of a great weapon that neutralized all magic below the seventh circle, a great unliving one that even an aura sword could not touch. The saint began to use holy magic, thinking with his mind that since such a demon appeared here, it means that somewhere nearby there must be another necromancer, but he will be able to get to him only after he deals with the dragon. 
When the dragon was completely hidden in the blue glow of divine healing, Fea and Iriel, having been able to move, admired that it took only one spell from Rey to kill the great dragon of fear. However, suddenly, their joy was premature, a violet light sparkling in the empty eye sockets, destroyed Rey's magic, and the dragon opened its mouth. Zeke shouted to the saint to be careful because the dragon was gaining breath for a deadly strike. A beam of destructive force pierced space and rushed towards the battlefield faster than the speed of sound. Ray, in his typical manner, was surprised that the creature was so powerful that even its magical shield was cracked. Ignoring the shocked people behind him, Ray cast a healing spell one after another, causing the bone dragon to literally float in his magic. Finally, a huge amount of blue magic collapsed destroying the dragon, and leaving only a trail in the air behind it. But even after that, Ray could not sense the necromancer. And behind his back, Iriel had already reached Zeke, treating him with her magic. However, even after this, the Lord did not wake up, and his wounds were still covered with demonic energy, so dense that Iriel's divine power could not do anything about it. Behind, already understanding where this was going, Ray approached, creating strong scissors from his magic and stopping Iriel from futile attempts. Seeing these wounds and knowing a lot about medicine, the guy was amazed that Zeke was still alive. Taking off his shirt, Ray promised that he would do everything possible to save the Lord. Ray cleansed his hands with a spell. And although they were in the worst place to perform such an operation, he ordered Iriel to ensure that no miasma or demonic energy touched them from the outside. Fea, seeing the knife at Zeke's stomach, screamed in fear. But Iriel silenced her. Placing his hands on the man's chest, the saint first decided to cleanse him at least a little of the demonic energy and could hardly resist a cry of pain. Sweating with diligence, Focusing all the demonic energy from Zeke's body into his left hand, Ray regained his strength and began to clean the wound before the operation. Having created an amazingly thin thread of divine magic, the guy now needed to connect the arteries to ensure the correct flow of blood in the body. Ray's hand turned black, but now was not the time to hesitate. But Iriel, looking at what Ray was doing, had mixed feelings. On the one hand, she was ashamed that she herself did not fully trust Ray and his methods. And by stopping Fea, she stopped herself first. And on the other hand, she could feel with every cell of her body that Zeke was getting better. And this made her ashamed more. In addition, she noticed the saint's blackened hand, and now she was worried about him too. As soon as the last stitch was made, Ray fell unconscious. Iriel immediately rushed towards him and extended her hands, wanting to heal his blackened hand. However, no matter how hard she tried, the saint could not do anything and helplessly almost cried, realizing that she needed a specialist in this matter who could give Ray special treatment. As if in response to her thoughts, one of the seven messengers in the familiar bone mask came out from around the corner, unnoticed as always. She commanded her colleague to take the saint away with a heavy sigh. While Ray dangled head down on the messenger's back, Hong Yang informed Iriel that they were taking the saint with them to Salonia to give him proper care, and expressed hopes that Iriel would also arrive for the same purpose. Iriel agreed to come to the saint's estate, but first she had to deal with the remaining deals, no matter how worried she was about Ray. A man in a surgical gown woke up when he was called several times to go to the operation room by a colleague. He has given his medical history to another doctor and confirmed that he remembers perfectly well that a heart surgery is now scheduled. As he enters the room, he senses some sort of catch. Something keeps him uneasy as he looks at the patient in the oxygen mask, reminding him of someone familiar. He urges himself to come to his senses asks for a scalpel, but in response, the other doctors turn on him, their hands beginning to glow with a soft green light, 
and they themselves are wondering why a scalpel is needed when magic can be used. And at this point, Ray jumps up on the bed in horror, waking up from a strange dream. The bright sun shines down on him from a familiar window, and he realizes he is in his chambers, so the first thought that comes to his mind is the thought of servants. Both maids are already in place, and while the dark-haired Euclidwood looks stern, little Mary does not hesitate to cry and openly rejoice at the saint's return. After stroking the girl's head, Ray gets a question from the second maid, who doesn't hesitate to tell him that it was a foolish and insane act. Saint quipped to the girl that she must have been worried sick about him, but the maid fiddled, parrying that she just wanted to keep her job. As Ray remembered Zeke, and Euclidwood grimly listed his horrible misdeeds, like not looking after Saint, and even sleeping deeply right now, Ray ran his gaze over the still dark hand. He looked it over in surprise and disgust, not understanding how he could still move his fingers, though he still remembered the terrible pain during Zeke's treatment. The maid told him that he had been cured by the saint and the chief priest, to which Ray fell out again. Although Ray had just woken up, the first thing he was taken to was not to be fed. He was instead taken to the basement where, on a tall square stand with a white cloth, lay an object that emitted a nightmarish amount of demonic energy. The evil heart of a bone dragon, left on the exact spot where the dragon had been defeated. Ray wondered why the hell he had brought this thing in the first place, and the maid told him that he should go to the lecture hall and explain himself to the nobles who couldn't believe that the dragon had really been destroyed. Ree's thoughts and mood were far from rosy, so ordering the maid to take the heart and follow him, he went with a warlike attitude to where he was invited. The lecture hall was filled with nobles, and the chief priest, upon receiving word that Ray was in attendance, asked everyone in the room to calm down before the meeting. The Veyborn Kingdom representative questioned the fact that the saint had not only defeated the dragon, but had also used magic, something saints normally cannot do. Finally, Ri, dressed in the white robes of a priest, entered the hall. And right from the entrance, he demanded that questions be asked immediately and directly, and he promised to answer. Marcus Philia of the Kingdom of Glamon clarified whether Ray had used magic to defeat the necromancer on his own. Re answered a simple yes without any further explanation, and simply demanded to move on to the next questions as soon as possible. Now the representative of the Regian Empire took umbrage, ordering him to provide them with some sort of confirmation of his words. The man said in a disrespectful manner that they had come to the Holy Empire to prevent the dire threat looming over the entire continent, so they had every right to be outraged and demand any proof. The princess of the Resian Empire also interjected, claiming that even a captured necromancer was not a valid argument until they saw Ray's powers with their own eyes. The chief priest immediately realized that they were now trying to test the territory and see if Ray was considered a threat to them, and if they should unite against him this time, since he had defeated the necromancer single-handedly. With a sly smile, Ikle looked at the boy, waiting for the show. Tired of it all, Ree didn't disappoint him, and directly asked his attackers if there was any difference in how exactly he defeated the necromancer. After another disdainful look from the representative of the Resian Empire, Ray took a step forward, slyly repeating his words about proof, and instead of answering, he materialized an aura sword, almost putting it to that man's throat, still wondering if the evidence was enough now. The princess, in the same contemptuous manner as the man, asked if Ray's move was an official statement of the Holy Empire against the Rhesian Empire. Utterly exasperated at this, Ray called his maid over to him and took the bundle from her hands, pulling out a bone dragon's heart, which immediately began to emit dark energy. He handed it to the princess, and she had no choice but to touch the heart with her finger. The brutal demonic energy bound the girl, and she couldn't even pull her hand away in horror. She couldn't even utter a word. 
Ray, on the other hand, brought the heart back closer to himself and stated in a loud voice that the Holy Empire had enough strength that they could defeat even a bone dragon. Now it was Ray's turn to ask questions, and he immediately inquired with a murderous expression on his face whether he should consider the actions of the Resian Empire as an official statement towards the Holy Empire. The startled representatives were forced to apologize in their official names. The saint unhappily clucked his tongue, not hesitating to express what he thought of the intolerance of some of the nobles. As soon as the chief priest nodded in agreement to Ray's request to return to his room, the boy left the lecture hall, hearing a clay ask if anyone else had any doubts. After a while, Ray wondered if he should visit Lord Zeke and check on his wounds. The maid immediately gave him a lecture on how a saint should behave and how he should not break his distance from other people in different circles. Euclidwood also clarified that there was a waiting list to meet the saint, causing Ray to stop in surprise. And the fact was that as soon as he left the lecture hall, the chief priest was bombarded with questions from everywhere, most notably about Ray's current level, to which Euclidwood had to say that even the Holy Empire didn't fully know the answer. However, she assumed their own estimation of the saint at the level of an eighth or even higher circle of magic. The powers that be were as shocked as they could possibly be, since even the imperial mages of every nation stopped at the sixth circle, let alone the ordinary citizens. The princess of the Rasian Empire, who had attacked Ray earlier, was the first to orient herself and immediately requested permission from the Holy Empire to stay here for a while longer. Eclay had agreed to accept representatives from all the other empires as well, and could only empathize with how much more work the guy would have to do. When Ray heard about this situation from the maid, he couldn't hold back a disappointed groan. Even though the Resian Empire had been the first to send him an invitation to meet, the saint had ordered to cancel everything he had planned and decided to go to Zeke's place instead. The carriage brought them to the Lord's estate quickly enough. Ray's hand continued to remain dark, having failed to recover from the demonic energy damage, but he didn't care much about it. Stepping out into the fresh air, the saint marveled at how much this large estate reminded him of Zeke's, and Euclidwood confirmed that the Lord himself had designed the exterior. A maid from Zeke's palace reported that the master was in his bedroom and offered to follow her while Ray wondered why Zeke hadn't stayed at Salonia Palace to recuperate, to which he received a disgruntled reply from his maid that it was Zeke who had taken care of the saint for the first time and had not let anyone, not even Euclidwood herself, near his idol and savior. After the woman's words that such behavior, while nice, was not necessary, Ray discerned between the words her hatred for the night, though she denied it. Swinging opens the door to Zeke's bedroom, Ray and the maid following him said hello to the man. Zeke hopped up on the spot, gazing in surprise at the saint he was so worried about. He instantly jumped off the bed and ripped his shirt off as soon as Ray told him that he had come to check on his patient. What happened next was a real show, with Ray marveling at the quick healing of Zeke's wounds, the knight himself thanking the power of the saint for it, and Euclidwood demanding that Zeke stop showing his exposed skin to the saint and cover up at last. Zeke snapped at the woman and suggested that she not come to him anymore, since she was so busy, while Euclidwood explained with a furious look that she was following the saint not choosing where she wanted to go. After Ray's shout, the woman immediately apologized, and the Lord hurriedly recanted her words and assured him of eternal peace and goodness. In fact, besides the main purpose, Ray also had a hidden purpose, so after checking Zeke's wounds, the guy ordered the seven messengers to come out of the shadows. Hong Yong was the first to appear, already stressed enough by this for Zeke who failed to see her presence earlier. But when he was prevented from raising his sword against the assassin by another of the messengers, the man was horrified to realize that he had not only sensed her from afar, but also up close. Euclidwood, despite her dislike of Zeke, 
recognized his abilities, so jerked forward to defend the saint, when she too was overridden. Ray clapped his hands and tried to stop the mess, and the seven messengers lined up behind him in an obedient row as he introduced them. The knight and maid stood in silent shock. One of the seven messengers wondered why they had been summoned to appear now, if they were not allowed to show themselves in front of other people. And there were strangers in the room. Ray paused for an important pause, and first said that it was an order, and they could not disobey it, and then said that from now on they would all have dinner together. Shocking not only the messengers, but also the knight and the maid, who were still in shock from the first time. Meanwhile, deep in some castle, a conspiracy continued to brew, where two cloaked figures resented the failure of their plan, with the bone dragon. While the blue cloak suggested destroying the empire, the red cloak said to start by removing the saint in their way. For example, by sending him away from the holy empire to other kingdoms. Using his magic to grill the meat and sticking it on the aura sword like an ordinary skewer, Ray gave everyone here a look of shock and regret. With his usual gesturing smile, Saint, when asked about the reason for having dinner together, replied that he was just hoping to improve understanding and work between the three families, since they had to cooperate anyway. Pushing everyone to eat, Ray made sure that the seven messengers took off their bone masks for the rust in a long time, even though they looked confused while doing so. Hong Yong, who followed the other's example, bowed her head obediently, taking it as an inevitable order. But the guy immediately explained to her that he didn't want to achieve their cooperation through violence. Lord Zeke was the first to speak up, stating that the Trey family would cooperate. A grim Euclidewood asked if he realized that this meant breaking family tradition, to which Zeke only waved her off as his family's purpose was to protect the saint, so there was no problem with his choice of methods. With glances consulting amongst themselves, the seven of the Dane family raised their hand and swore to cooperate. Seeing that things were going better than she expected, Euclidewood had no choice but to follow their actions and promise the Bellacorks family's cooperation. However, she didn't stop there, and said that although the Bellacorks family's mission was to seek information for the saint, there was also a side mission of no less importance to stay by the saint's side until the last, through marriage. Everyone's faces were inexpressibly stupefied at this point. But Ray took first place as the main subject of conversation. Thoughts of what Euclidewood had said did not leave the poor guy the next day as he sat in the throne room next to Iriel. Everyone had been so surprised yesterday that the woman had hastened to confess that she had not wanted to tell of such a thing, because marriage was only a method of fulfilling her mission with dignity, and that she had not yet thought of such a thing with Ray. However, the fearful look in her eyes and her sly clarification that it was only for now kept him on his toes even as he got to work. Coming to bow to the saints, the very representative of the Resian Empire, Lord Gregory, had once again apologized for his rudeness in the lecture hall some time ago and had brought a box of gifts to make amends. As soon as he opened the box, Iriel jumped up from her seat when she saw a piece of jewelry and explained to the confused Ray that this was a great craftswoman who had lived several thousand years ago and had created masterpieces. Besides, although there was only one earring, legends say that magic could be used to find the second earring, so it was an insanely valuable gift. Lord Gregory assured that this legendary treasure only confirmed their sincere intentions. Placing the earring in his ears, with a smile that sparkled like the jewelry, Ray suggested the Lord get out as soon as possible for the next nobles awaited in the hallway to bow. The Lord, however, did get another moment of the guy's attention, and invited Ray to pay a diplomatic visit to their region empire. Ray's mind immediately whirled with a hundred thoughts about how majestic the Resian Empire was, what resources it had, and how different the methods of treating people there might be because of that. The aristocrat who noticed his thoughtfulness immediately began pouring honey into his ears. 
first by complimenting him on the greatness of Ray's deeds on the territory of the Holy Empire, and then by suggesting that they cooperate to organize business with the Resin Empire. His plans were simple. It was not so much business and money that mattered, but the power of the saint, which had never been seen before. But the unimpressed Ray thanked him sunnily for the offer, but refused, saying that he had enough to do in his home holy empire. He even shouted those words louder so that the line of nobles outside the door could hear his intentions as well. Lord Gregory had to accept his defeat, and he bowed out, asking Ray only that he not forget his invitation to visit the Regian Empire. Euclidwood, standing behind the back of Ray's throne, asked if he was really thinking of the interests of the Holy Empire, and Ray confirmed that he was telling the plain truth. The boy also asked to gather all the aristocrats who were still nearby in the hall to announce some very important news. And leaning over to Iriel, he asked for her help as well. But she, in her typical manner, chose to hear the information first before giving her consent. With a slight smile, standing up from his throne, Ray spoke words that could shock he wanted to open an entire academy for doctors to teach local healers how to treat people with his techniques. He reminded her of the condition Zeke had been in days ago, and that it wasn't the holy power that had saved him, but Ray's medical skills, and explained that he wanted to make it possible for ordinary people to help the wounded. Iriel breathed out a sigh of relief, agreeing to help since it was such a noble cause. However, she doubted that her help was needed at all, as Ray was a true hero to the entire holy nation. As Ray had planned, there was an uproar in the hall when the aristocrats heard of his plans to found an academy of medicine. But with Iriel's encouragement and her knowledge of political games, it was decided to create an academy not only a place for medicine, but also for magic, which appeased most of the aristocrats. And it was because of this that Ray was finally given the title of Professor of the Academy. Ray felt great in his role as a teacher, his enthusiasm infecting everyone around him. He was surprised to see more people attending his first lecture on magic than he had expected. It was because not only the students, but also the professors had thrown themselves and decided to attend the class of the saint who had such a high level of magic. In addition, rumors of a strong, handsome lord were spreading among the students at a terrific rate and given the eighth circle and the mastery of two powers at once. It should not be said that the hall was full house. The academy was now filled with noble families of various statuses. Tapping the chalk on the blackboard to draw attention to himself, the guy finally started the first lecture with a question to the audience about what an expression of magic was. One of the students answered correctly, converting magic, proper spellcasting, and proper spell redirection, for which he received praise. But beyond that, Ray had the idea to convey that there are other ways to create magic, taking fire spells as an example. Having written his scheme on the blackboard, the saint managed to explain in simple words how to make any spell easier and more accessible for any magician, and offered to practice it right at the class. One of the professors, who was present as a supervisor, looked with amazement at the way the theoretical lesson was being converted into practice, and was a little suspicious of Ray's abilities in this scheme, although he admitted that it had a point. Suddenly, the same student who had successfully answered the question earlier shouted in delight that the method worked when a drop of water appeared in his hands without too much effort. He was the first, but by no means the last, to understand the pattern and match the spell, and Ray watched their reaction with pride. The saint's thoughts were on his upcoming medicine class, from which he expected no worse, when he was interrupted by the professors attending the lecture as students. Jumping around him with delight, they showered him with compliments, and even inquired as to the name of this ingenious theory, which would have to be presented to the Association of Magicians. Shrugging awkwardly, Ray calls it the atomic theory. Sometime later, in a completely different place, the students couldn't contain their excited shouting, looking at the bright blue glow in one of the classrooms. 
and the whole point was that the professor, previously surprised by Ray's methods, having spun the scheme that the saint had voiced in his spare time in his head, had not just been able to succeed in spellcasting he had broken through to the fifth circle of magic, after years of stalling. So, while Ray was still sweetly slumbering into his pillow, he heard loud screams, banging, and noises that shouldn't have been there this early. Barely getting out of bed, he opened the door, begging for the door to stop battering his room, and not realizing what was even going on. And on the other side of the bedroom was a crowd of students, sobbing at the realization of the prospect, begging for another lecture, and even signing a petition to make magical lectures a permanent thing. Infuriated because he'd been torn from his sleep for such a cause, Ray cast a bunch of spells on the room to make sure the door wasn't definitely kicked in with his enthusiasm by the students. And also, he wouldn't be disturbed by this screaming. Alas, he had to compromise with all these people and increase the number of magic lectures to two a week, which made him regret his desire to do it at all, because he had envisioned it differently. Meanwhile, away from all the noise, a blonde girl read out the request of the elven village to move out. The white-haired Elphis agreed, but asked for the paperwork to be done by the end of next week, putting aside her tea and checking the request. Her companion was surprised by such speed, but Lord Era explained that she had plans to make a trip somewhere soon, so she did not want to delay it. The Elphis immediately realized what she was talking about, and asked Era to tell Ray that she was living well too, causing her to blush slightly. The vehement denial didn't help, for Era was indeed going to the Holy Empire, so the pause came out awkward for the Elphis. Staring up at the sky with a warm smile, she remembered the guy she hadn't seen in six months, which wasn't a long time for an elf, but a strange melancholy settled in her chest. At the academy, however, things were much more active, for Ray had brought a professor who had advanced in magic the other day to assist in another class. The students' chuckles at this were quickly cut short by Professor Clarice's menacing stare. Ray once again adopted a serious expression, which combined with the glasses on his face and his academy uniform, gave him the right professorial look, and ordered the second lecture to begin. Ray didn't use too complicated examples, preferring to show everything in practice, so he asked Professor Clarice, who was assisting him, to demonstrate the air-cutting spell. Doubt was written on the faces of both professor and students, but Ray remained firm. He offered to use the spell, aiming not at him, but at the board behind him, to calm everyone present down at least a little, and through gritted teeth, the professor agreed. Sending the spell forward, the wind was ready to cut everything in its path. But Ray used his favorite word and canceled the spell faster than it was created. He explained to the students that due to the scheme of magic, since the two types of magic come from the same place, mana, even if a spell was created, it could still be canceled, and his words caused a real flurry of disbelief from the students. Briefly summarizing that this was his entire part of the lecture, he told everyone to split into pairs and practice stopping someone else's spell, to which they quite logically said that it was impossible for them since they weren't Ray, with the fervor with which soldiers in war are usually supported. Ray shouted that magic is basically a thing that defies logic, so they should never stop accepting and believing in new ideas. The students were moved beyond belief and motivated to at least try to practice. And that was all Ray needed. So he quickly slipped out of the lecture, wishing them good luck. Pulling himself up, the tired boy was glad he had time to prepare everything he needed for his upcoming medical lectures. He was nervous that these lectures might be unpopular compared to swordsmanship and magic when an incident caught his attention. One girl was being crowded by three guys and one of them was particularly huge. In the company of his chums, he was clearly trying to declare his love for her or something. However, the girl didn't look pleased. Ray felt it was his duty to come closer and intervene in the conversation to defend the student. 
The big guy immediately started making excuses that he didn't mean to intimidate her. But after the girl admitted that she was just frightened by his size, and that such huge guys were not her type, now Ray had to be rescued, because the big guy had somehow implicated him as the main culprit. He said such nonsense that Ray didn't even realize whether it was a compliment or an attempt to insult. The big man, encouraged by the beauty's words that Ray was actually her type, immediately drew his sword and threw his glove at Ray, challenging him to a duel. He loudly shouted his name and accomplishments, like his exam grades and fighting ability. But it was obvious that he simply didn't recognize the professor who taught the classes for mages. He paid for it when Ray smacked him on the top of the head with a stick, not even using his powers to cool down the angry boy. Ray threw the stick aside and gave an almost contemptuous snort, treating it as a mosquito squeak over his ear. And what was his surprise when the crowd around him erupted in applause and compliments, calling him almost a hero? After responding to the student's sincere, timid thanks, Ray suddenly smelled the familiar odor of alcohol and at first complained about the perfume. The girl, however, admitted that she had been making potions recently, as she was planning to take medicine lectures, since even people like her were allowed to enter. Ray, hiding behind a mask of cordial calm, inwardly shouted with delight, now believing that his lectures had gotten at least one student. The girl asked to be called Gria and even paralleled Ray's introduction with the name of the professor who would be lecturing. But it was her friend who cleared up the situation to the end, running up to the student and asking her what she was talking about with the professor. Looking at the flushed and flustered Gria, her friend elbowed her in the side, joking that she must have fallen in love with the new handsome professor. Gria's mysterious smile was her answer. Meanwhile, Ray had finally made it to his room, almost complaining about the lack of calmness throughout the day. As he was contemplating how exactly he should conduct his lectures next while sitting on his bed, suddenly Iriel's voice came from underneath him, and she stuck herself out, accusing Ray of messing around while she had to hide in her room. Scared worse than she had been after her encounter with the bone dragon, Ray wailed about what she was even doing in his room like that saying that she was just worried about how his day at the academy would go. Saint also admitted that she was doing even too much for him than a normal person. The atmosphere heated up when she changed addresses from Saint to Ray's name, almost breaking into his personal boundaries. And things could have gone too far, but the seal on the guy's hand glowed with a white light. And from the special portal to Ray's bedroom came a superior-looking era, the smiling expression on her face was immediately replaced by displeasure when she saw Ray not alone, but in the company of another girl. If Iriel was surprised to see a high elf standing before them, Ray was surprised to see exactly Era here, only guessing that it was a teleportation spell. Folding her arms across her chest, the beautiful lady pretentiously stated that it was obvious she wanted to see Ray. Sparks literally flew between the two women as Era made a lunge towards Iriel, and the saint immediately snapped back in her usual manner. He could not stand the tension any longer. So Ray pulled out the cloaks and handed them to the two girls, telling them that they were planning to leave the academy. Even the rough fabric of the robes could not hide the beauty of both of them, and the saint only sighed. Realizing that if he was seen with the elf and the saint in the same company, they would attract too much attention. Arriving at the cafe and taking a table, Era recognized that not much time had passed since her last visit to human lands, but much had managed to change. Ray's thoughts that elves have a very different concept of short time were interrupted by a waiter, awkwardly asking for permission to seat a group of other visitors who had been waiting for a seat for a long time. The guy recognized the travelers in them immediately, and they hardly argued at all, except to clarify that they were more like mercenaries. The only woman on their team said they were members of the Bilical Mercenary Guild. Ray thought back to what he had heard earlier about their success in their work, 
and in the meantime, the conversation was intercepted by Iriel. Excitedly questioning these mercenaries and their reason for being here, with great pride, the mercenary showed them the contract in which they had been asked to help with monsters and opposition directly from the Holy Empire. Era only said a word about being interested in their story, with all her emotionless elven beauty, and the mercenaries were already floating and ready to tell her even the code to their safe, with both male and female members falling under that spell. Thanks to this, the members of Billical's mercenary guild laid out all the information as a matter of course, which gave Ray a solid understanding of what was going on in the Empire. It turned out that although the number of lower-ranked monsters was almost zero, suddenly, the higher-ranked monsters began to gather in groups and act so coherently as if they had some special tactics. This worried Ray as he recalled the Bone Dragon and summarized that someone must be controlling them. Otherwise, the stupid monsters didn't come up with such plans on their own. Suddenly, the ground shook and screams from outside signaled the appearance of the monsters. Running outside, they saw not an ordinary monster, but an entire dragon like Wyvern. Furthermore, the mercenaries and mages were immediately frozen by an unnatural fear, forbidding them to even move. Era found this interesting, but hummed with boredom that using fear only worked if your opponent was weak. With two fingers, without much exertion, she threw the wyvern into the nearest counters, and it was the counters that were the most unfortunate in this situation. Pressing her lips together, the elfis snorted contemptuously, and finished her sentence about how having a stronger opponent to use fear on was foolish and pointless. Even after recounting the food and wood on the counters with her nose, the wyvern shook herself off and tried to attack again, but Ray restrained her in time with holy chains. Looking at its futile attempts to free itself, the saint assumed it had a mind of its own, for after Era's use of the fear spell, the wyvern should not have remained so active. Iriel, meanwhile, promised to deal with the newly approaching monsters. Meanwhile, in the dungeons of the Holy Empire, the torture of the captured necromancer continued. He was surrounded by the brilliant minds of every single empire. But the necromancer was a tough nut to crack, and even while reciting a spell he managed to mock them. The mages clenched their teeth in fury when the necromancer called their sixth circle skills a mockery of a great man like him. In fact, he had already come to his senses, and, with the help of his dark magic, had learned that the saint was not there so he dared to continue hatching plans to overthrow the Holy Empire without fear of being beaten again with one right hand. The chief priest entering the dungeon with a brisk gait informed the gloating necromancer that the saint had already arrived at their door. Eclay bent over the mad old man, regretfully explaining to him that all his plans would remain mere dreams, to which he laughed wildly in her face, with yellow rotten teeth, for it was not yet clear who was having the last laugh. It was only at sunset when Ray and company were able to defeat all the monsters in the area, now slightly perplexed as to what they should do with the bodies. A frowning Era, who was standing behind the guy's back, suddenly summoned him for a private conversation right that instant. Stepping aside, she cast a silent spell for the outside world so that no one could overhear them. She said that, Given her absence from human lands, she might not understand much about the local customs, so she would only describe her feelings about their surroundings. Growing darker, Era admitted that she had sensed large magical circles around her, even on the academy grounds, in different locations. Ray wasn't ready to hear about the magic circle, but the elf confirmed that at first she only felt slight mana flows that confused her. But the moment the monsters appeared, those flows intensified and accelerated. Unfortunately, Era couldn't tell what type of circles it was. She could only feel raw power without exact data. Ray froze in horror, knowing full well that it would be very difficult to break these circles without breaking a couple regions. And even though it's only enough to erase 30% of the circle, 
since they don't know their location, nor the materials used to draw them, it all becomes an impossible task. Realizing that even he might not be able to do it, Ray instantly began preparations to evacuate the people. Looking for escape routes, he and Iriel concluded that the evacuation would have to be in two parts, Northern Garol and Southern Sulian. To inform people to leave the city immediately, Ray climbed Ares' conjured high cliff from where there was better hearing. The guy applied magic so that every resident could hear him from every corner. With an order in the name of the Holy Empire, Ray warned everyone of the danger by throwing off his cloak, perfectly audible thanks to the spell, and visible against the sunset. People recognized his voice and appearance, but continued to run closer to him, asking questions and not wanting to leave so easily, so the guy had no choice but to launch a blast of fire at them. Hoping that such a demonstration to people would be enough, he jumped off the cliff and rushed down, feeling incredibly furious. Iriel, having received her assignment, hurried north, calculating in her mind that it would take about three days to evacuate, and the mountains would only make the road more difficult. Suddenly she looked over her shoulder, sensing pursuit. The girl stopped in a favorable spot where she was ready to meet the five people whose auras she had sensed almost the entire way. Dropping her hood, the saint turned directly to her pursuers, and those no longer thought to hide. Looking at the real saint with malicious anticipation, their masked faces couldn't cover their mouths, so they said unpleasant things without watching their tongues. And most importantly, they thought Iriel was almost not alive anymore. So they weren't shy at all. The girl was quickly surrounded, and if she wasn't too worried about the three, the middle-aged men had energy like Lord Zeke's, which meant they were no less experienced swordmasters, and they were the main danger to her. At Iriel's kind offer to spank them lightly if they confessed about the empire that had sent them after the saint, the young lads only swung their swords at her. Going after the saint with such skills and weapons was foolish, so they were instantly swept away by a golden glow. However, the problem of the two swordmasters still remained, as they were almost unaffected by Iriel's blow, and the girl wondered what kind of empire could afford so many mercenaries at once. Throwing off her cloak, the girl prepared herself for a hard, unequal battle, in which only one wrong move of hers, and an open weak point, and she might not come out of this clearing alive. She tried to approach them slowly, using not just her sword, but pure divine power. But suddenly, both men jumped from their seats at the same time. Iriel was surprised, for in such a battle they were risking more than just wounds. They were putting their lives on the line. And that was to the girl's advantage, for in such a battle even a simple turn of events. Unexpected enough, like the golden divine flash that blinded the mercenaries for precious seconds, could win. It was not Iriel, for whom the battle was unequal, but the hand of one of the masters, cut off by a sword of divine power. The men suddenly decided to chat, threatening the saint with great trouble, because of the immense power hanging over the holy empire, which even Iriel could not handle. But the girl dismissed all their words with a slight smile, for contrary to the strongest dark forces, the Empire had an incomparable advantage ray. The Swordmaster, having nothing more to say, took the final blow from the Saint's hand with a smile on his face. While Iriel was dealing with the Swordmasters, those first three mercenaries managed to get their feet away from her, but there was no way the girl would let them go so easily. The voices of the same three boys who had managed to escape echoed in the dark forest, cursing the Saint for her amazing power and questioning how they could get back to their own. However, a bright flash stopped them from even thinking about it, and the saint herself appeared before them almost in the form of a goddess of war. Iriel sternly suggested that they follow her quietly while she was still good, otherwise they would still return with her, but no longer in such an unscathed state. But the three boys, one by one, 
staying almost on the hysterical edge, suddenly twitched. Looking at them shocked, Iriel realizes that the mercenaries had bitten into the poison pills hidden in their teeth and were now choking on the red liquid filling their mouths. Such an attempt to hide the information and prevent it from leaking out would be very effective if they weren't dealing with the saint she simply healed them, and no one usually provides a second pill like that. Displaying none of the attributes of a servant of a god at all, Iriel looks at them with contempt and offers to simply cut off their legs so they won't try to run away from her again. She refuses to make concessions to the mercenaries with an indifferent look, reminding them that the attempt on the saint's life is a terrible sin, and they will have to pay for it with their own lives. But after the interrogation, the blonde-haired boy still asked one favor, adopting a submissive pose, and even the spirit within him had already surrendered to the victor's mercy. When Iriel promised a small favor for the pure truth, the mercenary, despite the threats of his partners, swore an oath on the mana, promising to tell only the truth and nothing but it. The mercenary revealed that he belonged to the Proxia faction, which had already attacked and committed crime in the Holy Empire twenty years ago. According to the official historical version, there was a monster attack then, but now it turns out that it was all organized by just one criminal group with far-reaching plans. Then the monsters did not just attack people and find their food, and selected the strongest representatives of which could be raised good mercenaries. Those who did not fit certain parameters were given to the monsters as a sacrifice, and those sword masters that Iril had seen before were also kidnapped from other kingdoms. With tears in his eyes, the mercenary confessed that Proxia had even kidnapped family and friends, and dared the mercenary to threaten to kill them if they didn't obey. After listening to his story, Iriel turned around suddenly and let them go free. Furthermore, she told them not to worry about the Proxia faction, for she planned to turn it upside down just to protect her empire that they dared to sharpen their teeth on. Hearing such bold words from the saint, that is, not the last person in the empire, the two remaining mercenaries also asked to speak, and Iriel agreed, but ordered them to follow her, for time was running out, and people were still in danger. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of the Academy, Ray tried to find at least a trace of magic circles. But unfortunately, he couldn't feel a single magical reaction. The surroundings were deserted, and only frozen in running poses were the people who had failed to escape, and therefore petrified and frozen, with a terrifying expression of panic on their faces. Suddenly, a startling realization occurred to Ray thanks to this after all. Not a single building had been destroyed, despite the problems with the people. Remembering Era's words that at least 30% of the circle had to be destroyed for it to stop working, Ray sent fire magic into the building, and a huge explosion shook the outskirts. And then it was clear to Ray because it was after the explosion, when some of the buildings were destroyed, that he felt the faint echoes of magic, which meant that the whole village was one big magic circle. Ray was suddenly distracted from his thoughts by voices nearby that were yelling about explosions. Ray was surprised that there were still people here, though they should have evacuated long ago, or at least turned to stone. So he immediately called out to them, the two men, recognizing the saint, tried to justify that they were in no way violating the evacuation order, and that they had only been caught off guard by one of the demons, and the only possible escape for them was to hide in the building. Ray wasn't so easy to fool, however, and he came to the realization pretty quickly that something wasn't right here and found inconsistencies. As soon as he had asked a couple of leading questions, the mercenaries had sprinkled themselves. And after saying that they killed the soldiers who were trying to fight the ghosts, and thus helped the monsters to escape, the mercenaries even bared their weapons. But their weapons weren't swords. They were pills that suddenly melted away as if they weren't even there. Ray would be interested in examining these pills, because the traces left by the people were catastrophic but he had no time left at all. 
So after subduing his curiosity, Ray launched a spell that fixed the mana around to track the presence of people around, because it would not be enough for him to wipe out 30% of the city from the face of the earth with just one explosion. In detail, calculating all possible possibilities, Ray used his magic and caused a huge earthquake. Meanwhile, Iriel had already listened to the story of all three mercenaries and realized that all this time, even though they had been in proxia training and doing all sorts of horrible things, they had not been deeply immersed in this filth. Now, knowing already much more about this group, Saint could appreciate how extensive their deeds were and how many things they had done under the cover of ordinary coincidences. Relaxing a bit, the mercenary who had first told her about herself asked Saint about her own childhood and assumed that she had grown up in a rich and wealthy family. This caused the girl to sink into memories that echoed in her with both warmth and sadness. Memories of a happy golden-haired girl with enchanting pink eyes. The story of Iriel began in a small church on a small island that was part of the Holy Empire. The girl was very different from other orphans by her bright appearance. Besides, she had an angelic character and rather sharp mind, so she was always in the center of attention. One day, one of the priests suggested to the then still small girl to try to travel and see the huge world outside the island. Although Iriel was really eager to get out there and see what it was like outside, she strongly doubted her ability to live on her own. But the priest, with an affectionate pat on the head, reassured the girl and said that he would always be at her side. Having received such a boost of motivation and support from a loved one, it was only natural that the then still little girl was really fired up with a desire to see the world. But instead of planning the journey for a long time, the priest suddenly said that they would leave today and did not even give the girl a chance to say goodbye to her friends. Riding in the carriage, Iriel suddenly notes that they had time to pass the village, but never entered it. But the priest reassures her that they plan to head towards the port. The little girl didn't see the danger at all and didn't suspect the kind uncle when he said they were going to Geral a rather large town that was quite different from the island villages. Climbing into the ship, the girl happily endured all the time on the road, enjoying the sea and the sensations of the journey ahead. Then the man, as they stepped onto the dock, offered Iriel a drink of the holy water he had prepared, especially for her to celebrate their journey. Obediently drinking what he offered her, and not even suspecting his intentions, Iriel instantly felt something wrong. Her whole mind went blank, and the last thing she saw in front of her was the smiling face of a seemingly kind priest. But the priest was kind only in appearance, because when she came to her senses, she saw that the very man who had been supporting her all this time had sold her to some strange people and resented the fact that she had been given only two gold coins instead of three. With the same sweet smile, the priest admitted that it was a slave port for the slave trade, leaving the girl in shock and a sense of betrayal. Iriel couldn't believe her ears, and she felt like something in her soul broke at that moment when she heard the priest call her a slave. Finally, getting her with every word, the man said that she could indeed write letters to her friends and send them whenever she wanted, but not out of kindness, he planned to send other children from the orphanage here as well. So the girl with the colorful looks became a slave. The only thing she wanted was to hide from the world. She sat for four days, staring at the wall, unable to get up and recover from the moral wounds of betrayal, alone in this big world. As the day came when she was to be sold, all her observations through apathy came in handy the girl managed to memorize all the characteristics, habits, and weaknesses of the gang that trafficked children. The cross around her neck had been given to her by her mother, and she remembered how painful the loss of her mother had been for her, looking at the only memory left to be treasured. While the man in charge of the slaves happily lost his hands, looking at the child's striking appearance, Ariel thought of a plan. And when the man thought that the girl had already taken her breath, 
because she hadn't moved in a long time, she shoved the very cross her mother had given her down his throat, so that the girl would always remain strong. Memories of the cross that had once been sprinkled with someone else's blood, just so she could live still lived, in that little iron on a thin, ragged rope. Of course, Iriel didn't go into detail when the mercenary asked her childhood, but quite honestly admitted that they could have called her an assassin, which the mercenary didn't believe. They had already arrived in Garol, and the priest of that city came out to meet them, bowing low before the saint. The girl had a right to look at him with hatred, for this was the man she had trusted more than life, and who had sold her to the slave traders years before. Heavy memories filled Iriel's head again as she remembered how she had escaped from the other slave traders, and how she had to survive. So she had gone to the dirtiest of methods to keep herself alive and had no concern for the lives of those who tried to capture her. The cross in her hands, which should have been a symbol of her freedom and faith, became a symbol of her hope for her own future, which she had to forge on her own. And each time she was chased, the girl violated the same terrible doctrine of the church, and with each such encounter was covered with more than just blood over her skin and hair as if she were marking herself with stains that could not be washed away. She was covered at first with guilt, and afterward with an armor that made her blame not herself, but the world around her that allowed such an outcome. Iriel was about to become another lost child, completely ruining her soul, when a sudden bright golden glow illuminated her path. For some reason, the goddess chose her and endowed her with the gift among all the others. But that was what had saved her, for it was then that she realized the value of human life and the futility of revenge, which gave nothing but more pain. So now, looking at the face of the frightened priest who had sold her out earlier, she didn't feel that pain. All that remained in her eyes and in her soul was pity for the fallen man who continued to live with the weight of guilt and fear of receiving punishment for his deeds. Meanwhile, Ray continued to destroy the city, but with each blow he realized that he could not just take and break absolutely everything. Already seeing the outline of the circle, he noticed the symbolic placement of the buildings, and now realized that the entire layout of the city was built in such a way that the buildings themselves became part of the runes of the magic circle. Suddenly, something warm ran down his face, and he felt his consciousness blurring. Another magic circle unfolded above him, and he found himself in the very epicenter of the demonic magic going on. Due to the unfortunate location and his own efforts, now the magic of the circle began to conflict with Ray's power, and the guy could not hold back a cry of pain when the purple lightning bolts bound his body. Moreover, the main problem was that the saint had already used a great deal of magic when forming the explosion earlier. And now that the demonic energy of the magic circle was penetrating his body, he couldn't control and resist it at all, much less heal it. As if these problems weren't enough, he found that portals had already begun to form on the sides of him, and monsters were pouring out of them in packs. With brown under his nose from overexertion, and with purple mana hovering around him, and demons arriving, Ray admitted to himself that he wouldn't be able to fight them in this state. However, the truth was also that if he didn't, they would definitely go after the people who had evacuated. Therefore, he had to bear his aura sword instead of hiding, and at least recovering a bit. Unfortunately, the spell in the circle he was in was created in such a way that every time he used his magic, the blood in his body began to boil. Suddenly, arrows from somewhere pierced his back, and Ray himself fell down, unable to dodge in time. The boy felt some guilt for being too careless while the monsters around him were already coming closer, glaring with red eyes. He was unconscious, alone with these creatures. Meanwhile, Era watched the people evacuate the city and thought that Iril was doing her job right since everything was going smoothly. Suddenly, she felt rather than heard Ray calling her and her ears twitched excitedly. 
The elf immediately activated the portal, sensing that Ray's life was in danger. There she saw that he was already practically inhabited by monsters, the boy himself being unconscious. Full of uncontrollable rage, the girl swept the monsters around with her emotion alone, as her eyes glowed with blue power. However, she was horribly shocked at the form in which the man she cherished lay before her. For Ray was completely shrouded in dark mana, unconscious and covered in his own blood. Era immediately began to treat him and tried to wake him up, but the very sensation and smell of the dark power she had never forgotten for twenty years left her in shock. It reminded her of the curse that had put her in a long sleep for twenty years, and now she could smell it on Ray, and she had no choice but to bow her head in sorrow. The guy was lying on a daisy-lined bed in the center of the hall, looking spirited and carefree. After news had spread of what had happened to Ray, many of those who had followed him had been saddened to tears, and the Holy Empire itself had hailed him as an incredible hero, and even bestowed upon him a title that no one had ever received before Abel. This was to be expected, but as soon as the Holy Empire lost the support of the saint, who was representing the forces of an entire country, one of the kingdoms began to attack. Now they had to save themselves on their own. Feeling almost on the verge of insanity, Iriel unfortunately recognized that even if the problem with physical exhaustion could be solved, not a single soldier during those three days could rest mentally. Suddenly, a great many people she had never expected such a thing from, such as the representatives of the Resian Empire, had come to their aid. The saint looked with unimaginable sadness at all those she had previously thought were just children. But now they were fighting directly, without respite. Iriel admitted that Ray should have rested for the rest of the war, and only then awakened, so that for once they would rely on their own strength rather than involve the saint. However, her moment of melancholy was suddenly interrupted when mages and swordsmen of astonishing power appeared on the battlefield those she had not expected to meet so easily. According to recent spy reports, they had been spotted in Selene's empire only a few days ago, so she didn't understand how they could have reached the Holy Empire so quickly. Iriel glanced over to Zeke, and when one of the swordmasters tried to attack them, they barely fought off his blow. The man didn't take them seriously at all, and his next blow was already much stronger. He didn't believe they could stop him, Lord Zeke pushed the saint and was hit because of it. But he didn't doubt it for a moment, because she wouldn't be able to withstand such strength. This man was at least an intermediate or even a top-level swordmaster. Iriel frantically shouted to the soldiers to retreat as soon as possible while there was still a chance. The enemy group's swordmaster, who had attacked Zeke earlier, strongly disliked this, and tried to attack Iriel as well. But at the last moment, the divine energy managed to save her, and the man nearly lost his sight. Iriel remembered how at the camp they had discussed them in their next moves, and one of the newcomers who helped make plans was Gria, the same girl that Ray had once saved. Iriel had to listen to her because she was an amazing volunteer among the academy students, and the plan was accepted quickly enough. Then, at the camp near the campfire, when they took a moment to take a breather, Zeke asked Iriel if it was hard to do without the saint. The girl sadly confirmed his words. She said she had no idea how much Ray had endured and how much he had done for them. But she also said that she was a saint herself and she couldn't rely on Ray all the time. The three people who joined them then agreed with her and said that it was about time to bring back the Holy Empire's true strength. Lord Zeke was perplexed that they had so easily left their comfortable chairs and traded them for a military camp. Though being aristocrats, they didn't have to. But one of them said there was no point in convenience when the Empire was on the brink of war. One couldn't help but think of the fact that it was thanks to Ray that they could now gather here together, because his plans to reorganize the Empire had helped the aristocrats, mages, and warriors alike a great deal. After all, 
if before these people were just aristocrats taking care of their estates, now they had come to the rescue in the most difficult time for the empire, regardless of their own benefit. Meanwhile in the castle, Era continued to cleanse and heal Ray, though there was no result, alas. The elf ordered the maid to always stay and talk to Ray, so that he would always have contact with the real world. Euclidwood couldn't help but recognize that no one could have achieved what Ray had achieved to receive so much attention and care not only from humans, but from elves as well. The girl took seriously what Era had said about keeping in touch with the saint, so she spoke aloud about how Ray was missed by far more than one person right now. Depressed and downcast, she didn't notice the little finger on Ray's hand twitch. In fact, Ray slept only outside, but inside he was in some strange subspace. He had no rest because his normal mana had been replaced by the mana of two curses that were of the same type, and therefore opposed to each other. Both curses were visualized in the form of a bone dragon and in the form of a snake, and at first they stayed away from each other. The guy was calculating how to deal with this problem, since one similar case had already happened when he tried to heal Era. So now he just had to wait for the two mana to be pushed out of his body. However, Ray unfortunately couldn't help himself on his own. So, coming to the tricky part. The guy disturbed the dragon's mana stone, and made it think of another curse in the shape of a snake. So now Ray was watching two different mana battle the bone dragon's magic, and the new curse's magic. But so far, no matter how hard the bone dragon tried, his opponent was quite strong. Although it was affecting Ray negatively, he just tolerated it and angrily thought that he didn't know who had created such magic. But once he caught him, that person would not be happy. In the conversations of the maids in the castle, meanwhile, stories were spreading that the war was very hard and even Lady Euclidwood had gone to the battlefield. And the main thing is that the criminal group is approaching and not just getting rid of, but also taking not only adults, but also children, who could be raised into walking weapons. Meanwhile, on one of the fronts, everyone warmly welcomed the girl, and even the captain of the 8th Cavalry Unit was insanely happy to see Euclidwood. The girl was gathered on the battlefield and believed that with such successes, and they could well defend not only Selene, but also Garel and Salonia. However, since their enemies were scattered not only on one side, but in different places, she decided to split her squad and send some of them to the mountains. Suddenly, Euclidwood felt some strange flow of mana and tensed up. Meanwhile, in the castle, Ray finally opened his eyes after a long time, and the curse that had made his hand blacken, and that had been eating away at him, at least mentally all this time, finally left his hand as well. Ray's method of provoking the two forces and making them attack each other was obviously successful. Ray couldn't move yet. However, he could feel the mana, and that was very important to him as he was now sure that he was all right, after all. And now he just needed to heal himself. However, when he started the healing, his own hand, which had previously been cursed, felt very different. It took the guy a few moments to come to a realization now. Thanks to what had happened, Ray could activate mana much more easily and in larger quantities. So he had literally advanced and everything that had happened was not for nothing. Having healed himself on his own while applying a special new method, he felt much better than before. He was now ready to fight and save the Holy Empire, and was free from any restrictions in achieving his goal. Meanwhile, Iriel was not doing so well, and after commanding the army to group up and move back, she began to accumulate divine power in her body because she absolutely had to apprehend those people from the criminal gang. She was stopped from doing anything reckless by Zeke and company, saying that they would take care of it and do their best. Iriel disagreed with them and tried to talk them out of it. But Zeke said that even knowing that they would die here, it was still the most important thing to make sure that the holy of this empire was in order. 
otherwise the war would be over in an instant. Sighing, the girl called upon her mana again, but no longer to attack, but to protect all the soldiers from being hit, applied healing and full protection. As she spoke the words that they should not have died on the field, she already knew that unfortunately not all would be able to escape given the strength of those men. Zeke began to give out orders, but he was so taken aback by the words of his attackers that he abruptly jerked forward to punish those who dared to speak such loud and foul words towards the saints of their empire. However, he was blocked by one of the sword masters who spoke disdainfully of the skills of the Holy Empire's soldiers. Despite all of Zeke's skills, this master was quite difficult for him to fight against, and so far the score was one to one. The man from Proxia's Prospid faction couldn't believe that this small empire had so much talent that he wouldn't mind getting rid of. While they were talking, another one of the villainous team went around Gria and almost defeated her with one punch. But the girl managed to stand her ground. The members of the criminal group proceeded to battle, and the Holy Empire's army was constantly suffering terrible wounds, for the strength of these people was much higher than the ordinary ones. Zeke was shocked that just because of just two people, their army was suffering such defeats. The sword master of the enemy team was tired of waiting for the Lord to turn his attention to him, so he lunged forward, and Zeke barely managed to defend himself. Suddenly, something flashed before his eyes, something bright and shiny. It was the snow that appeared along with the arrival of Euclidwood, who unemotionally told him to surrender quietly and calmly to those who were attacking the army. Meanwhile, Iriel had managed to get out and almost make it to Salonia. But she was completely unfazed by the fact that she had left the soldiers behind and had to run away so disgracefully. She was given no time for respite. Two of the men who had attacked the army earlier had already arrived behind her, never leaving her alone. The girl prepared her swords with the help of divine power and promised that she would not give up and would defeat the two at once, no matter what it cost her. The members of the faction, having activated their power, simultaneously lunged at the girl, and she would hardly be able to survive this blow. Suddenly, however, those mages were split almost in half by a blue light and a wave of relief swept over Iriel's eyes when she saw the back of her favorite Ray alive, unharmed and very angry. Ray, in his usual manner, asked if they had planned all this in his absence, and if they were the ones who had cast that spell on him. After the villains of the criminal group admitted that, unfortunately, it had only stopped him for a month, and they regretted it. Ray angrily exclaimed that one month was not just a period of time for him. Therefore, having already lost a lot of time, he said he would get rid of two of them at once, so as not to waste any more time. Two from the group exchanged glances, and though frightened by his power, they lunged forward and grabbed his arms. This all happened in a second and Iriel only managed to think that their movement of mana was as if they were trying to transfer their mana to the boy. One of the mages shouted that he was just a human and couldn't withstand the infusion of mana from two swordmasters at once. In a moment of confusion, Ray acknowledged that such a forcibly infused amount of mana could disrupt his mana flows and seriously harm him. However, after a massive explosion pierced the sky with blue light, the boy dusted himself off while the two men lay prostrate and said they just needed to choose their opponent wisely. Iriel, again in shock, looked at the boy, feeling she had missed something in him, something new. Ray, in turn, said he would not wait for her, as there was very little time left, so he ordered her to simply follow him to the best of her ability. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, Zeke looked terrible and was in critical condition. Euclidwood tried to find out how bad he was and whether he could hold on any longer. But she herself saw that everything was not cheerful there. Even her moment of confusion was attempted to be exploited by the enemy, and she had to defend herself urgently. 
She had originally planned to fight two at once, but one after the other. But now she saw that while she would defeat the first villain, Zeke might not survive this fight. The witch from the criminal group was surprised by Euclidwood's strength, considered her an abnormal person, and even admitted that it was quite difficult for her to dodge the ice spears. Suddenly, a terrible sound distracted Euclidwood. Unfortunately, the sword master of the criminal group found an open spot on Zeke and pierced him in the stomach with his sword. Euclidwood frantically called him, but Zeke fell to the ground in front of the enemy and could not utter another word. And that man, even without receiving significant wounds, was already preparing to attack Euclidwood. The girl was in terrible fury and prepared to defend herself to the end, but she didn't have time to cast her spells because the enemy army suddenly began a rapid retreat with terrible screams. And one of the soldiers pointed out that he had arrived the saint. The witch and the swordmaster of the enemy group were shocked by his appearance, and the whole battlefield practically froze, leaving their battle and watching his walk. Approaching Zeke, Ray, unfortunately, realized that the body of the man he so valued was already cold, and that he had died just a few minutes ago. Euclidwood confessed, clasping her hands tightly and almost crying, that she was weak and that her abilities were not high enough to protect Zeke. Ray harshly asked, who dared to do this because he planned to cut this person into pieces? The witch from Frosty told her partner to be very careful, as she felt amazing strength from this guy, and that he was not as simple as he looked but he did not perceive Ray as a serious threat. The girl didn't have time to say anything more because the very next second she was literally split into uneven parts. And Ray himself, with a grim voice, without turning around, said that judging by her position and power, Zeke's death was clearly not at the hands of that girl. It seemed that only white fury remained from him when he turned to this guy. The swordmaster tried to say something like a malicious assurance that the saint of the empire was truly a monster, but it was clear that listening to him was the last thing that interested Ray. Lifting Zeke in his arms, the saint entrusted Euclidwood to finish the military actions on this field and prepared to leave. Ray himself teleported to the forest and laid his friend's body on a stone, analyzing his condition. Unfortunately, the swordmaster had lost a lot of blood, and many parts of his body were already wounded, so Ray simply did not see ways to save him. Finally, Iriel caught up with the saint, and with the same great regret looked at Zeke's body, not believing that the guy had really lost his life in this battle. She unleashed her divine power and illuminated his body with light promising that the Empire would never forget his sacrifice and all that he had done for its inhabitants. However, this light awakened some flashes of memory in Ray, and an utterly incredible idea, considering the current medical time, came to his mind. Maybe, just maybe, they could save Zeke. Iriel was terribly upset and understood Ray's condition. But divine magic was not omnipotent and Ray simply could not bring a dead person back to life. The boy, it seemed, agreed that magic could not do it, but he himself was quite capable, so he materialized a scalpel in his hands, looking serious, once again saving Zeke. As soon as the scalpel touched Zeke's chest, the saint immediately screamed for him to stop, because the previous case could not be compared to the current one since life and death are only the affairs of God and ordinary mortals can do nothing about it. Ray, with terrible seriousness, said that if life can only be saved by the will of God, then he will either break this will or become a God himself and do it on his own. Expecting the worst because such expressions were taboo, and such words should be followed by divine punishment, she was greatly surprised because nothing happened to Ray. Ray had no choice but to shrug and just ask her to believe in him. Remembering everything that had happened before, 
and all those cases when Ray turned out to be capable of what no one had been able to do before? The girl agreed, and even offered her help. Ray did not waste any more time and began to analyze Zeke before starting another operation. As a medic, he understood that the Swordmaster's brain was no longer working, but his body, after using Iriel's divine power, was in excellent condition. Using his medical knowledge, he realized that the golden hour was starting those four minutes from the moment the heart stopped beating, and he could save the man. Gaining access to the heart by removing the ribs, Ray thought about what he could use instead of medical instruments. And using his creativity, he launched lightning into Zeke's body as a defibrillator. Moreover, he had to use air magic to circulate air through the man's body, as he could not breathe on his own and there was no lung ventilation system at hand. He had to massage the heart with his own hands, and Ray prayed to all the gods for it to work. Lightning after lightning, air after air, massage after massage, he performed resuscitation actions in this medieval magical world. And suddenly, both Ray and Iriel heard a short thud, but this meant that Zeke's heart was beating without Ray's help, the boy immediately demanded that Iriel quickly heal Zeke, and the girl, absolutely not believing, began to use her power. Zeke breathed evenly and deeply again, although she had previously seen with her own eyes that he could not do this, and there was no spirit in his body. The logical question followed, who the hell was he, having done all this with his own hands? Ray simply and cheerfully answered in his usual manner that he was not the only one involved in Zeke's resurrection, and that it was their joint work that brought such amazing results. To which Iriel immediately tried to excuse herself from this, as such black magic was not something she desired, and this caused Ray to laugh in relief, seeing that everything was slowly getting back to normal. Now that Zeke was all right, he still had other tasks. So leaving Iriel, Ray immediately galloped away. The girl didn't even have time to tell him that coming to the Pope now would not be the best decision. Meanwhile, the entire city was engulfed in flames. Standing on a rock, towering over all this hell, was Lord Gregory, the representative of the Rhesian Empire, who had initially offered his help. He laughed madly, looking at the horror unfolding under his feet thinking that soon the people of the Holy Empire would lead him to a safe place, as he had hidden well and played his role to the end. However, apparently, he had not hidden well enough, because a weapon was already pressed to his throat. As the mysterious man ordered Gregory not to move, and he jerked sharply, trying to free himself from the grip, his hand flew to the ground, followed by the Lord himself, but only in pieces. The man was sure that he had surrounded himself with a protective barrier, so he was very surprised that someone found him, and even managed to approach him so silently. Stepping on him, one of the Dane family angrily asked who his boss was, and the man suddenly realized that it was not one person, but there were seven of them. Gregory tried to blame the senior priest of their empire, but Hong Yang clarified that she wanted to know who gave him orders in the criminal group of Proxia, not some silly excuse. Realizing that even being without a hand and completely defeated, the man was not going to say anything, Hong Yang ordered one of the seven Danes to get into his brain. The girl was displeased with this, but obediently applied magic, and the outlines of a cross began to appear on her forehead, quickly gaining the brightness of golden glow. The man did not believe that such magic could be available to anyone, as even senior priests or saints cannot do anything like it. But this was the last thought formed in his head. Having received information from the Lord, the girl contemptuously pushed him away with her foot, as he was no longer able to say anything coherent, struck down by this magic to the point of foaming at the mouth. Having received their tasks, the Dane family split up to solve this problem and finally returned to the saint. Meanwhile, Ray arrived at the very heart of the Holy Empire, 
and ordered the soldier who greeted him in surprise to tell the Pope that he wanted to meet with him. Arriving at the Pope's place, Ray told him that Proxia was not just a lousy organization, and that it was formed not out of nowhere, but from an alliance of their neighbors and even the Holy Empire itself. The Pope immediately declared that he would track down all the traitors in the Empire and deal with them as soon as possible, and as harshly as possible, but Ray warned him that there was no need to do so, and that it was better to wait until all the wraths came out. Angered by Ray's words, the old man did not understand how one could turn a blind eye, even for a while, to these criminals. And Ray did not understand why he was so furious and reckless. He again asked the Pope to calm down and not give in to emotions if he wanted to achieve a good result and get rid of the criminal group for a long time. Leaving the hall, he did not see how much the Pope's face had changed and how dark his thoughts were, filled not with thoughts of the Empire's prosperity. Walking in the opposite direction from the office, Ray was still thinking about this. This criminal group surely had gathered more masters than they had shown before. But Ray needed precise information to prevent another such group in the future, when he could no longer help the Holy Empire. Meanwhile, a bright dawn was breaking as Lord Zeke rode his horse on the road, clenching the reins in powerless anger and shame. It was all because the saint had forbidden him to appear on the battlefield when he finally came to his senses. Although he was very indignant about this, the girl using the trump card and saying that Zeke needed to take care of himself because the saint had already helped him once, managed to convince him. She promised that the three families and she herself would solve the issue with this war, and Zeke needed to come and join the path of the saint. During the journey, Zeke remembered his childhood, how strong he was in his teenage years, and how he was called the strongest possible. As a member of the Trey family, his destiny was to help and protect the representatives of God the Saints. However, when Ray met Zeke and blocked the man's sword with just his bare hands, the Swordmaster thought that there was still much he did not know in this world. Because after that moment, he wanted to give his whole life into Ray's hands and become his loyal servant, assistant, and bodyguard. And the more painful for him, was the realization that he had become not a sword, but a real burden for the saint. And because of this, he felt terribly sad. He shouted that he was the worst guard, and Iriel, watching him from the window, was worried about the man. In fact, she had kept Zeke away from the war, as Ray had asked her. But she still did not understand what he was planning to achieve with his actions. At the same time, the saint came to the dungeon to the necromancer, and the old man met him with a cunning smirk, assuming that the empire was now in flames, and Ray simply confirmed that everything was very bad, and he came to ask the necromancer a few questions. When the necromancer laughed and said he wouldn't tell Ray anything under any torture, the boy seemed completely unopposed. On the contrary, he looked very cheerful having carte blanche to use not just torture, but a more terrible method, pointing out the shortcomings of the necromancer himself. Taking a file out of his bag, he listed other terrible diseases that were in the necromancer, and then suggested that when he gets rid of these diseases in the old man, the latter would be immensely grateful. However, looking like a real devil, he did not plan to act for the necromancer's gratitude but just wanted to check how compatible the bodies of humans and trolls or orcs were. So, after some time, when the old necromancer looked like a young beauty, albeit hairless, the necromancer begged for mercy, asking to be saved, just so they wouldn't touch him anymore. Ray was terribly disappointed that the old man gave up so soon, because he had many more modifications planned. So, the essence of Proxia was quite simple, five magical towers that maintain balance among themselves. And then when Ray competed and fought with a dragon and an army of the dead, he actually defeated the Black Tower, so all the other towers hate him and want revenge. 
The necromancer also proudly and eagerly told about the fact that Proxia has fifteen swordmasters and seven mages of the Sixth Circle, and that no matter how strong he is, he will not be able to defeat them. Which Ray, of course, did not even listen to. But to his question about where the main base of the criminal group is located, the beautified necromancer answered with a cunning smirk that it was in the Grencia Mountains. The Grencia Mountains were the first mountains on the continent, where elves and gnomes could coexist, as it was a neutral zone with good lands and resources. Ray had to admit that it was indeed a very good place to maintain an army away from the Empire and remain unnoticed for so long, and he would even like to send a meteorite into those mountains, but he did not want to harm the innocent elves and gnomes. It's not to say that Ray was very scared, especially after the recent modification, thanks to which he had no previous limitations, but the fact that, besides the fifteen swordmasters and mages, there was also a mage of the seventh circle made the last battle a bit more difficult. Summoning Hong Yong, the saint ordered her to go to neighboring countries to monitor movements and react to everything that happens. Noticing that something was troubling her, he asked what the problem was, and she replied that, naturally, his orders come first, but she would also like to join the army. Ray was surprised by her initiative, but agreed with her, saying that they need to use their forces more thoughtfully. His first decision didn't change, and he still sent one of the seven messengers on a reconnaissance mission, because this mission was much more important than an ordinary battlefield. Hong Yong looked at the boy who sounded like he had gone mad, saying that if the other army has special forces, they need to create something too, with some doubt. Sometime later, Zeke stood at the door to the saint's office, hesitating to enter. However, the maid reported his presence, so he had to move and even enter the office, lowering his head. He expected to be scolded or even despised, but instead, Ray simply came up, patted him on the shoulder, and told him to be on the training field the next morning. Shocked, the man asked if Ray really didn't want to send away a soldier who failed his mission, and Ray was annoyed even by the fact that his friend had such thought. He tried to convey to the guilty conscience of Zeke that he had put a lot of effort into making the man invincible, so all he needed to think about for the next few days was training as much as possible. He also said that he knew how much Zeke had suffered and tried, so if there was someone he could trust his life with, it was the Lord. With a confident look and a sparkle in his eyes, he affirmed that Zeke was the sword of the saint. The man was inspired and immediately knelt before him, expressing his respect. And the next morning, he was so full of strength and enthusiasm that Ray himself wanted to cry from it. Now Ray set about teaching Zeke to use his powers anew, and not just to summon the mana of the Swordmaster into the weapon, but to find a balance. He suggested visually dividing the sword into three parts, and distributing these parts equally to feel maximum control over the weapon. After the words that Zeke needed to break old habits, the process went much faster, and the man himself was surprised by his results. The Lord tried again and with guidance, quickly did what he was told in the end. Ray just told him not to give up for another three days, and to hone this skill in this time, to which Zeke agreed without doubts in his master. Although it was said about three days, Ray did not plan to force and expect a perfect result in such a short time, because he knew how difficult it was. However, he had plans to leave the Holy Empire for some time to deal with problems so he needed to leave it in the hands of someone he trusted very much. Suddenly, he felt a strange but familiar flow of mana and beautiful era emerged from the portal again. Ray called her delightedly and even stood up from the chair to greet her. However, era, apparently, did not expect him to be in perfect order, so she blushed and got nervous as soon as she saw a live and healthy Ray. Unable to restrain herself, she hugged the boy, and he warmly and gratefully returned her embrace. When emotions settled down and they had enough hugs, 
Ray told Era about his suspicions regarding the Garcia Mountains, and the elf said that this place is governed not by her, but by another high elf. Because of this, Ray was a bit concerned because it was not easy to enter these lands, considering how unfriendly this race could be. He understood that especially since he plans to fight on their territory, he would be maximally unwelcome. And not only the village he needed to go to, but also all the other nearby elf villages would be against him. Hearing that he was asking about the strength of the elves, Era said somewhat indignantly that each high elf is immensely strong, but she is the guardian and keeper of the high elves, so her power is much greater. Ray promised Era that he would try not to cause any conflicts with the elves, but she did not really believe him. To Era's great regret, she had to return, and she said that she was immensely glad that Ray had recovered, and was frank in her words. Finally, she said that the head of the Garcia Mountains is a calm and accommodating elf, so as long as Ray does not act too loudly, everything should be fine. Hearing these words during the farewell, Ray felt only more disgust towards the criminal group, because they chose the most convenient place for themselves, but did not think about the poor residents of those places. Three days later, Ray came to Zeke to check his results. The man demonstrated his new skills, and Ray made such a sour expression that the bruises under Zeke's eyes deepened twice. Then the man confessed that when Ray taught him and showed how to handle the sword, he felt something awakening inside him and wanted to improve it. The saint realized that by explaining to Zeke how to use the aura sword, he not only gave him a technique, but gave him a deep understanding, which the man, worthy of the title of a junior master of the sword, successfully developed. Now, the Holy Empire in his absence will be in safe hands, and he does not have to worry. Offering to teach the swordmaster another tactic, Ray stood in a combat stance, ready to attack with a cunning but pleased smile. He swung, but did not immediately deliver the blow to Zeke as if waiting for something. The man was slightly offended by such disbelief in his strength, but at that time, obediently analyzed the saint's sword, which despite the difference in color, seemed to him the same as his own. Firmly deciding that he would parry this attack, the man was not at all ready for the sword to suddenly melt in the air. His eyes reflected sheer question marks. With the same smile, Ray said that this would be his last lesson, and that in real battle mode, it feels even more exciting. Because the blue aura sword, passing through the sword Zeke put up for defense, rushed to his head without any obstacles, as if it was made of water. Shocked to the core, the man reverently asked if there was any way to block such a strike, to which Ray evasively avoided answering. It was time to talk about the future and the saint, returning to a serious demeanor, announced that he plans to head to the Proxia base. Zeke immediately stood up to follow the boy but received a slap and was forced to calm down for at least a minute. Although the man was entrusted with the defense of an entire empire, he felt offended that he could not follow the saint and was even scolded so ungraciously. Finally noticing Zeke's tired look, Ray asked if he had eaten at all while training. With noticeable bruises under his eyes, Zeke responsibly answered that he would never leave the training field for some food. He only didn't receive another slap because the hungry are not beaten. Meanwhile, the servant Eklai reported to her that her departure had already been recorded as prayer time, and none of the soldiers would follow her. Another news about the Inquisition's advancement made the High Priestess slam her fist on the table in emotions and the news that the Inquisition did this despite the absence of her order, but with the permission of the Pope, shocked her. Ecle immediately jumped up, threw on her top priestly clothes, and ordered the servant to follow her, almost flying out of the office with a sharp step. And Ray was already in the mountains, dressed warmly for the winter weather. A loud sneeze echoed through the mountains, alerting everyone to the arrival of the frozen saint. Realizing that with each step, 
even his specially magically heated clothes are no longer helping. And the blizzard is worsening visibility. Ray decides to set up camp and make a stop. Warming up by the fire, the boy resembles a contentedly ruffled cat. Thinking about whether he can use something in this forest to make the fire bigger, he spots a slender tree growing right in the middle of the field. Grabbing its thick branches, he tries to pull and uproot the stump when an inhuman voice demands he immediately stop these attempts. Ray doesn't react immediately, dumbfounded for a few seconds. But when the tree turns around and looks at him with a toothy and eyeful face, he raises his hands in a soothing gesture and backs away. While Ray wonders what kind of wonder this creature is, it aloud declares that normal people don't wander into these forests. Ray retorts that he didn't expect to see a forest monster tree here either. Feeling offended, the creature states that it is actually a dryad, and asks not to confuse it with some demons. Ray already had images of dryads from his own world in his head, so naturally he didn't believe that a dryad could be anything other than a beautiful, semi-clad forest beauty. The creature, angered by the disbelief, extends its roots from the ground to stand more upright. After a lengthy, silent eye-to-eye -eye confrontation, the creature turns its back to Ray with a funny tail and changes the subject to the extraordinary divine powers of the boy. After hearing that Ray is a saint, it asks to share a drop of divine power with it and promises anything in return. Ray ponders his request offer for a long time, not forgetting about his original plans. The dryad, lowering its head, sadly says that without these powers it can't return home to the forest. It turns out that some dark people came one day, weakened the forest and its creatures, and occupied these places on their own, depriving many of their home. Ray is immediately struck by this story, realizing that he has come across a creature from the mountains he is heading to, and these dark people are the Proxia criminal group. With a bright smile and a nod of approval, Ray tells that it's a fantastic coincidence, as he came to this place to punish those people. After these words, the Dryad even agrees to help Ray and fetch him branches, so he doesn't have to sustain the fire with magic. So, it simply breaks off one of its arm branches and throws it into the fire, even remarking that it's the best wood Ray will find in the area, sparking Ray's further desire to help this creature as soon as possible. The next day, the blizzard ends, and the boy walks through a normal forest, no longer needing wood and magical clothes. Suddenly, as soon as he enters the elven territory, he is stopped by one of the border guards. With naive, childlike simplicity, Ray asks for an audience with the High Elf, which naturally results in him being sent away deeply and for a long time. Ray didn't expect a warm welcome, but it still upsets him. Who knows where this conversation would have gone if the Supreme Elf hadn't descended onto the clearing, supported by the wind. When greeted more amicably, the boy starts sharing his problem, but the elf's attention is not captured by him, but by the earring in his ear. The supreme elf of this village had exactly the same one. In just a moment, from a kind soul, he turns into a fighting machine, emitting a terrible aura around him. The elf doesn't believe Ray's words that it was a gift, as these earrings were the property of the village and the legacy of his mother. Honestly admitting who he is and where he's from, Ray awkwardly scratches the back of his head, not understanding the fuss. But as soon as he hears the name of the Resian Empire, the elf starts attacking directly, declaring that friends of this empire are their enemies. Ray disappointedly admits that things are not going very well when magic hits him and an explosion is heard. Barely avoiding being toasted to a crispy, appetizing crust, but failing to keep his clothes in good condition, Ray ran away in a wild frenzy from the enraged elf. The elf yelled for Ray to immediately return those earrings, not considering that dodging someone else's magic, this would be the last thing on the boy's mind. Countering with a remark that he would suffer anyway, whether he returns the earrings or not, Ray just kept running as fast as he could, 
not wanting to draw the group's attention by using magic. The elf quickly lost sight of him, no matter how hard he tried, and began to doubt Ray's human nature because of such speed. In a calm environment, the saint deeply regretted what had happened. As he planned to defeat Proxia with the help and consent of the elves, but instead, the legend of the second pair of earrings was triggered. Even in this escape, the eternal optimist managed to find a plus, as he was able to understand the geography of this place, and roughly realize where Proxia might be located. All torn up, the boy set up camp to avoid going hunting in the middle of the night, and instead get a good night's sleep and set off the next day. Even before the sunrise, Ray had already risen and tracked all the locations he had previously charted on the map. He calculated that they probably use the same circles for defense as in the academy, so he needs to be careful and not repeat that situation. Suddenly, the boy was interrupted by some noise. Going a little further, he surprisingly saw a wounded group of elves and gnomes in the middle of the forest, looking at him suspiciously, realizing that they needed help despite the fact that he was very ungraciously expelled from the elf village earlier. Ray couldn't stop himself from helping. He suddenly dashed forward, and before he was grabbed, blinded everyone with a bright flash. When the gnomes blinked, there was no one in front of them, and they thought everything was fine. However, Ray himself jumped out of a portal nearby, not alone, but with a wounded elf who immediately started cursing him with all his might. He slapped some green goo on the elf's wound, and the elf immediately felt relief, while the boy said that he made these medicines from plants found in these forests. The elf and elf, realizing that they were helped, immediately slowed down and thanked for the rescue, even apologizing for their initial rudeness. The elves told that they had a skirmish with the gnomes, as usual, over territorial issues. Introducing themselves in turn, they noted Ray's respect for nature and looked at him even more favorably. Then came the logical question of what the boy was doing here, to which he briefly told them about the enemy army of humans hidden in their forests. The elf snorted and said that he knew about it, and even named the exact number 150 people. Shocking, Ray because such a number could not simply cross the snowy mountains, which means that Proxia had already established connections with other kingdoms, allowing them to enter from a more convenient and safe route. Now, Ray directly said that that army plans to destroy the continent, and he came to make them disappear from the face of the earth. Receiving an offer from the elves to help in return for saving their lives, Ray asked them to take him to the village and arrange a meeting with the Supreme Elf. However, as much as this couple wanted to help, it was not in their power, as only the seniors can decide whether to let someone into the village. Deciding to at least rid himself of one problem, Ray handed them the earring and asked them to bring it to Chersey, the Supreme Elf, who had chased him around the mountains. And for the next three days, Ray spied on the Proxia criminal group, spending all his time recording all their actions, habits, culture, and generally gathering any information that could help him in battle. And one day, he began to act, starting by catching a small forest animal. The seven from the Dane family, having initially embarked on a special mission for Ray, were now discussing the results of their inspection of other kingdoms and were dissatisfied with what they saw as traces of Proxia were everywhere. However, the main culprit still remained in the Holy Empire, and the movements it was making were beginning to cause concern. They had just started talking about how all the threads lead to the Pope, who had taken all the power under his control, when one of them suddenly stood up sharply and made everyone fall silent. She detected a strange source of mana located in the Vatican, moving out of the city very quickly. Immediately going into combat readiness, Hong Yang gave the order. They must eliminate this source of mana, and any actions aimed at protecting the saint were allowed. Meanwhile, Eclay was also having a tough time, as she was infuriated by the Pope's actions. 
which she still perceived as childish behavior. But the next moment, the door of her office was almost ripped off its hinges, and soldiers began to enter, ignoring her words. Moreover, she was ordered to quietly say goodbye to life, as one of the mercenaries pulled out a knife with clear intentions. However, before he could act, he was intercepted by Hong Yong, who ended his life with one strike, managing to turn around and ask if Ekle was all right. Not having met them before, the high priestess was now in shock and could only nervously sweat. Meanwhile, Ray was starting a new chapter in the life of the enemy group, hiding in the mountains, as he had released rodents he had been collecting for several days. These rats carried the plague, which had claimed many lives in the Middle Ages. Although it was a magical world, sanitation here was at the same level as medieval Europe, so with his knowledge, it was not difficult for Ray to replicate this virus. From the same observations over these three days, in this settlement, there were almost no priests to whom people would turn in case of illness, and who were unaware of the existence of penicillin. Continuing in torn clothes, Ray was incredibly pleased with himself and the plan he had implemented. The mold quickly spread on the bread he had obtained. He then threw away the brown mold and separated the bread into different stacks with white and blue mold. He quickly finished his work, preparing to wait until he could produce penicillin. The village was already infected and lost its calm as the dark spots and the first victims fell to the work of the magic of the Black Tower. Naturally, the spores began to spread throughout the area as soldiers quickly began to say goodbye to life and many people caught fever and inflammations. Ray observed all this from the bushes from his favorite comfortable spot, ensuring that everything was going as planned. Proxia was supposed to collapse and disappear from the face of the earth without his further intervention, just with the help of one disease, which even priests could not cure. However, the boy did not rush to leave as he was still concerned about the story of Mage of the Seventh Circle in the ranks of Proxia, and he wanted to make sure that everything went smoothly and to eliminate this threat if possible. Moreover, Ray was a bit crazy, so he also expected to find more grimoires here, with the information he needed, for example. Travel magic. Allowing him not to cross these snowy mountains on the way back. After a while, Ray was already running up the tower, eager to reach the Sanctum Sanctorum, mocking the guards who lacked the strength to catch him. Seeing that the tower's top was guarded by swordmasters, the boy figured there must be something very important hidden there, something Ray desperately wanted to get. Without wasting even an extra minute, Ray dispatched the guards in such a manner that a saint would have long ago suggested he take a course in rehabilitation from insanity. His eyes shone as he thought about taking what they were guarding as a war trophy for all the days he had to spend there. As he expected, behind the door at the very top of the tower awaited a huge library, infused with magic from floor to high ceiling. However, something lying at his feet prevented him from going further and satisfying his desire for magical folios. It was a young man. They exchanged mutual looks of misunderstanding. Suddenly, the man on the floor realized that Ray was the one who had released the rats and plague, and he stood up, surrounded by an unusual dark energy for these parts. Ray, recalling this power he felt when the demonic magic circle in the academy absorbed him, fearlessly smiled at the creator of the circle. The black mage and leader of Proxia immediately assessed Ray's level and achievements, as if reading facts from a sheet. During the conversation, the topic of the necessity of committing inhumane crimes just for revenge came up. But the man Ray found refuted the saint's assumption, saying that revenge held no interest for him. However, experiments and research were important to him, for which he would do anything. Ray frowned as summing up this man's words meant that all the human sacrifices, all the suffering and tears, were just to satisfy his scientific curiosity. Suddenly, the man activated a new circle, 
deciding that Ray would be an excellent research subject, especially since he was such an interesting representative of humanity endowed with unique powers. The Seventh Circle Mage already considered victory in his pocket and even behaved contemptuously. But suddenly, he felt he couldn't move, and chains began to bind his body. Ray concentrated his power, coldly indifferent, stating that he couldn't allow such a threat to society to live. In the last second of his life, the mage realized that Ray was much stronger than him, and at a much higher rank, unfortunately. This knowledge brought him no consolation, as there was no one left to console him. Together with a huge flash stretching for miles around the tower, the criminal group Proxia was destroyed. At sunset, Ray was returning home, feeling great about this thought, as he was damn tired, and had already planned to surround himself with medicine upon his return. One of the books he snatched from the tower, which should have contained information about teleportation, was supposed to help him return home faster. The rest were of no interest to him. Alas, contrary to his expectations, the book did not yield to his magic and continued to tease him with its locked clasp. Meanwhile, the people who tried to attack Eclay had already been destroyed, and one of the seven messengers explained that they had been sent from the Vatican. Eclay did not refute this and quickly believed that the Pope was behind it all. She remembered how her conversation with him went a few days ago and tried to prove that they needed to quietly gather all the criminals of Proxia. But he did not calm down for a minute. Moreover, he declared that only the Pope can decide the future of the Holy Empire, and that he was endowed with this gift by God himself. Not falling for the trap of choosing sides, Eclay asked the Pope if he thought that the saint undeservedly held his position as a representative of God, and that his words had no basis. The Pope did not respond. But judging by the fact that he subsequently sent mercenaries for the high priestess's life, his answer in his eyes was unequivocal. Eccle, gathering her thoughts, asked one of the seven messengers to deliver a message.